It is a pleasure to welcome back to the program distinguished scholar at Middlebury College and uh, one of the founders of 350.org. He is on the Do the Math Tour right now, Bill McKimmon. Bill, thanks so much for uh, joining us. Fun to be with you, man. So now, Bill, you had mentioned to us uh, when we ca I caught up with you, I guess it was over the summer, maybe it was at uh, Netroots Nation, that uh, following the election, uh, you would be uh, rolling out a, uh, a new initiative, and uh, it, I guess it was do the math. And so tell us about <laughs> this. Tell us about this tour. Well, so we've been on the road uh, every night since election. The night after the election, we started in Seattle. and uh, We've now made it down the West Coast and down the East Coast, and now we're heading across the country. We're in Chicago today. Uh, we've done, except for a couple of nights at Thanksgiving, big shows every night, and they've all been sold out at two and three thousand seat venues. So it's a it's a different kind of thing than the environmental movement's done in the past, but we're finding it to be a great organizing tool. It's all about taking on the fossil fuel industry directly. And uh one of the tools we're using is divestment. And we there's about hundred and forty now college campuses that have kicked off divestment campaigns in the last few weeks as we've done this tour. So it's really you know the 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 road show itself is exciting and lots of fun, but the uh, key part is that it's translating into organizing and fast. So tell us about what um, what what does the d divestment uh, involve? Uh, I mean, I I, I was oh, we're trying to get Go we're trying to get colleges, universities, churches, pension funds to sell their stock in the big fossil fuel companies. Uh, the theory is that you know the the math that I laid out for all of this in Rolling Stone in the summer, and it's the basis of this tour, simply demonstrates how irresponsible these guys have become. They're a kind of rogue force. They've got five times more carbon in their declared reserves than even the most uh, conservative government thinks would be safe to burn. So, you know, what the tobacco industry was to individual human beings, uh, the fossil fuel industry is to uh, planets, of which we only have, you know, one that we can inhabit. Um, so it's a, that's what we're getting at. And in fact, we actually had way ahead of schedule, the first college that announced it was divesting all its funds from fossil fuels uh, just a few days ago. Unity College in Maine, their board of trustees voted. A few days later, the student body at Harvard voted three to one to demand that uh, the Harvard uh, trustees do the same thing. So the fight is on. That's fantastic. And what's the, what's, I mean, tell me what the, the, how does this represent a shift in the, the thinking um, about how to organize and get active in terms of, of global warming? Because it seems to, well, well g explain that, explain it to me. We're going, we're going much more after the fossil fuel industry than we have in the past. Um, um, that's the thing. Uh, uh, we're, we're hard at work trying to get uh, the industry sort of tarnished, not so much worrying about their bought and paid for politicians at the moment, although we're continuing to work hard on things like the Keystone Pipeline. But the real task right now, Sam, is just to, to try and change the basic dynamic here. Uh, we think that the fossil fuel industry and their wealth and the political power that it translates into is the reason we've had so little luck uh, for so long in getting anything done in Washington and a lot of other capitals. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, Chris Hayes, and maybe it was uh, the weekend that you were on, but, uh, but I'm not sure exactly when he said it, but he, he described it um, that uh, climate change is an issue that we haven't seen since really slavery as an institution, at least in the context of this country, where there was so much financial resources and so much... Uh, financial interests at stake in, in, in changing our perspective on this. Yes. I mean, it's obviously not a perfect analogy since slavery is a much you know, more abhorrent moral thing, but there's also the kind of parallel that, uh, uh, you know, people are saying there's no possible way we could run our economic system without, it, you know? Um, uh, and in fact, we're finding out that that's not true. The, the, the good news from this, very bad year, a year that's seen record flood and heat and drought and everything else. The good news is 
uh, coming from Germany, the one big country that's taken seriously any of this stuff. And they're just beginning to show, more than beginning, astonishing results from their renewables program. There were days this summer when Germany produced more than half the power it used from solar panels within its borders. Uh, 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 that's a sign that, I mean, given where Germany is located on the map, that's a sign that what we need is not uh, sunlight, it's political will. And uh, hopefully we can start to supply some of that. But it means getting past the political power of the fossil fuel industry first. I was going to ask you about that because we actually um, uh, had Osha Day, uh, Gray Davidson on the program. Uh, oh, isn't that the a other terrific day- book? His Kendall, yes. Uh, Kendall there or whatever it is. It's really something. Yes, and it's 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 encouraging because on some in some respects, it seems to be the first um, pro. I don't know how to really describe it, but it seems to be the first sort of optimistic argument um, in terms of our capacity to deal with this problem. And, you know, my question to him and my, and my question to you, too, is, you know, what, what have you seen in terms of across this country? Because it seems to me that localizing the generation of our uh, power through the sort of distributed, uh, through a distributed uh, system um, is something that, that can sort of happen in parallel to as we have the existence of this sort of fossil fuel uh, centralized based system. I think that in one sense that's true. The problem is that as long as fossil fuel doesn't pay anything for the damage that carbon does in the atmosphere, you're always going to have this tremendous cost advantage uh, to using dirty energy instead of clean. So it's why it's a two-pronged fight. We've got to be doing locally, you know, this is, you know, most of my writing and stuff for years now has been about the need for local economies, local energy, all of that. We have to be doing that, but at the same time, we have to be working globally and nationally to change the ground rules so that this can happen, not just happen, so that it can happen fast enough to really matter. That's the problem. We're up against the clock now. And, and do you think that there's any way for us to, to overcome the climate crisis and uh, continue sort of our, our lifestyle, keep driving uh, Well, I don't think, you, no, I don't think in exactly, yeah, I mean, some of the stuff we can, we can keep doing, I, there are things that we can't, I, I you know, I, I, I don't see any way that allows the kind of endless continued growth of, of uh, jet aircraft travel around the world, for instance. Um, um, but that's okay, because in, you know, the last 10 years, We've learned to do. We've learned to do an awful lot of our traveling by mouse. You know, uh, suddenly the uh, internet is doing some of what Pan Am used to. You know, um, and we're going to have to do more of that. So we can't have. We can't just take the American huge American machine, toss out the internal combustion engine, stick in a windmill, and carry on precisely as before. But uh, you know, the world that we're building will, in many ways, be sweeter than the one we're inhabiting now, and far more democratic once it's, you know, energy sources come from close to home. Uh, one of the other things I want to talk to you about was the, um, we also had the opportunity to talk to uh, Jeff Orlowski, who, whose film uh, Chasing Ice is now uh, yes. playing across the country. And I just We're be- showing little little snippets of it every night on this road show, trying to get people to go to it. It's an amazing film, it's- and people got to go see it if they, it comes to near them. And we just played actually a, just a short uh, video, I guess, that was shoot uh, shot of a woman coming out of the movie, basically. Uh, talking. I saw that she said, "I've listened to Bill O'Reilly yeah. every day, and and now I'm now I'm believing global warming." And yeah, that was powerful testimony. Talk, talk to us about what the the concept of feedback loop is, because I'm now seeing, you know. Uh, uh, the UN, I guess it is, is now talking about, um, you know, monitoring the, the permafrost, which apparently is not so perma anymore. Uh, well, a study yesterday showing permafrost melting at a faster rate than we had thought. Um, not good news at all. Um, another big study today showing sea level rising about 60% faster than we had thought. Uh, also not good news. Uh, look, once you um, heat the planet to a certain point, uh, things begin to start happening of their own accord, and we're clearly getting near those points, uh, which is why it's so imperative that we, you know, stop talking about what we're going to do in 2050 and start taking serious action right now. 
Now, is that is that the feedback loop? I mean, when uh, when you start to when the the processes, the damage that we're doing to uh, the environment start to feed in and create even more damage. Exactly right. When you know we have our hand on the thermostat for the moment, but if we raise the temperature high enough that say permafrost is melting in large quantities and methane is being released into the atmosphere, we don't have any way of dialing that down. Uh, we can dial down the CO2 by, you know, changing our cars and factories and things, but we don't have any way of refreezing the permafrost. And uh, I also want to talk to you about one of the things, uh, there was a story out today, uh, or the, I guess it was today in Slate, talking about, um, you know, that to a certain extent, under the Obama administration between the, um, the, the stimulus, the American Recovery Act, and uh, other initiatives, that there, is, there seems to be a little bit more attention being paid to efficiency. But when you view that in the context of the greater argument about energy independence, um, wh- why do we see the, sort of the argument of energy d- independence being sort of discussed almost as if it's a separate context from climate change. You know, as well, a- no, it's always discussed that way as if the real, I mean, it's, 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 this, it's this thing we've fallen into now, and I think sometimes the Obama administration's really fallen into it, of solving the kind of lingering problems of the 20th century instead of focusing on the emergent problems of the 21st, you know? I mean, this energy independence thing is something that people have talked about for 50 years, how sad it is that we import oil from places or whatever. Well, that, that may have been the worst problem we had uh, with oil 25 years ago, but it doesn't even come close to the problem that climate change presents now. Uh, so it'd be much better to start talking about independence from fossil fuel, uh, you know, which we're clearly, if Germany can do it, I mean, Germany lacks Arizona, New Mexico, California, Nevada, Florida, Texas, uh, you know, Munich, north of Montreal. So I, I, I don't know what we're um, monkeying around with. And and we're on the uh, the eve of the uh, Doha climate change talks. Give me a sense of, are there other countries, I mean, obviously uh, Germany is one which is addressing this in, in an incredibly aggressive fashion. Are there are there other countries out there that are 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 leading this charge? I mean, what 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 are the dynamics, at least in terms of on an international level? Um, who are the players that we should be looking to that are pushing this, and who are the ones uh, that are dragging their feet? Well, it's a pretty short it's a pretty short list. I mean, it's really short if you if you if you say what are the non Scandinavian countries that are uh, engaged in this. Um, look, nobody's covering themselves with glory. Everybody's waiting for the U.S. and China to act. Uh, U.S. and China keep saying, I'll wait for you. You know, you first. No, you first after you. Uh, it's just turned into a sort of macabre dance. Um, and, you know, we didn't, I didn't even bother going to this Doha thing this year. It's all, you know, just a charade at this point until we break the power of the fossil fuel industry enough to open up some real possibilities. And, and and what is that? I mean, what does that look like? I mean, breaking the power of the fossil fuel industry is it? Is it? Ah, uh, you know, there was a time not that long ago when Philip Morris was a perfectly respectable company. You know, the way that Exxon is today. Uh, uh, we got to get to the point where uh, they're, you know, they're the biggest financial players in our elections and things, where that comes with a cost as well as benefit to people. Is there any attempt um, to uh, uh, attack, I guess, this industry in the same way that the tobacco industry was attacked in terms of of some type of civil actions, yeah, uh, legal I mean, actions? Clearly, this would be the, the mother of all torts, you know. Right. But it's almost, I mean, the problem almost is that it's so big <laughs> that it's like, it's hard to find a court. It's sort of unclear what court you go to when your country has just disappeared beneath the waves, you know. Um, um, there are people doing good work along these ways, and we're sort of waiting for some breakthroughs, hopefully. But i got to tell you, right now, our court system is not really in the hands of uh, uh, people inclined to listen very carefully to these arguments. And, and let me ask you this, and this, uh, this is also a question from the audience, but, I mean, it's, it's one that I've asked you before, but 
Um, how do you, uh, both personally and I think, you know, as a, uh, as one of the, the nation's sort of leading activists on this front, um, continue to stay positive? Uh, because, I mean, we, it, well, it's just, you know, that there's a lot of people willing to fight. That's the thing. I mean, we've been getting reception to this. If people go to mass.350.org, I actually don't think there's any tickets left any place for the upcoming shows, but they can at least get a sense of where it is that, you know, just watch this kind of spreading excitement. We'll have a video, a kind of concert video of all of this that our friend Josh Fox is putting together, and it'll be out by January as a kind of organizing tool so people will be able to see it. And they'll see the kind of energy that there is all over the country for taking action on a scale commensurate with the problem. That's the thing. And, and so what is the uh, what, what follows this? I mean, uh, I, I assume that you guys have sort of gamed so, this out in some, some fashion. Yeah, so there's a lot of things. I mean, you know, gamed it out to some degree. Um, uh, there are a lot of things. We'll be running these big divestment campaigns as many places as we can, helping people all we can to make them work. And then there'll be uh, sort of shareholder uh, meeting, you know, civil disobedience, that kind of stuff going on, hopefully building up into a kind of summer of action. But we also, of course, have to very quickly take this worldwide. So 350.org works in 191 countries. We're, since we think the UN process is broken, we're convening a, um, a uh, sort of global kind of global power shift, the summit of six or seven young people from every country on earth in Istanbul in June to kind of try and shame them into doing what they should be doing all along. Are there, um, I mean, are there particular countries that might be, uh, where the, it is easier to attack the, um, uh, the fossil fuel industries? In other words, they have less. There's some interesting possibilities. You know, Norway is a very interesting country, very progressive, but also a big state owned oil industry, you know? So, We'll see how it goes. Interesting, because I would imagine in you know the the getting at the place where the the, the sort of the power is you know less concentrated. This country, it seems, has been dominated by oil interests for seventy five years in some respects. Uh, yeah, this is we're the most addicted country on earth, so it's no wonder it's the hardest nut to crack. Um, but there's a lot of hard nuts to crack and. Frankly, I'm sort of probably rather be working here than try to do the same thing in Russia right now. Right, indeed. All right. Well, uh, Bill, I really appreciate. It. I know you're uh, you're you're obviously literally running on tour, and yes, I I've got to take off here. I'm such a pleasure to talk to you, Sam. Thank, Thank you, you, guys, Bill. as always, for your good work.